Hi, good evening. Tonight our guest is Dexter Filkins. Mr. Filkins is a Pulitzer awarded journalist who has widely covered Middle East, South Asia, Afghanistan and Pakistan for various media outlets. He also wrote several articles on Turkish politics. His book, The Forever War, won the 2008 National Book Critics Circle Award and he is currently a staff writer for New Yorker. Tonight we will discuss Mr. Filkins' latest New Yorker article titled Turkey's, Turkey's 30-Year Coup. Mi Mr. Filkins is based in New York, so we will do the interview through Skype. Hi, Mr. Filkins. So I want to start with the title of your article, Turkey's 30-Year Coup. Why did you think that it was necessary to look back to last 30 years of history to understand what happened on July 15? Well, I don't... I don't get to I don't get to write the headlines for my pieces, unfortunately. But I I thought that was a good headline right? because I think you know one of one of the things that I learned, um, and this isn't you know it's not the first time I've written about Glenn, and it's not the first time I've written about Turkey. But one of the things that I learned is that this this you know the the Glenn movement is. It's, it's been in the works for a long time. And what I think, you know, what, what appears to be their pretty uh, sophisticated effort to infiltrate the Turkish state, you know, that, that, that began a long time ago. And I, I think we wanted to communicate to, to our readers that, you know, particularly for a Western audience, uh, the, the, the attempted coup that happened on July 15th uh, was a kind of one-day affair, you know? Uh, some people tried to take over the government and that was the end of it, you know, they failed. But in fact, and this is what we are trying to show, I think, or try to suggest to people was that this, is, this was a story or an event that was many, many years in the making. So, like, you wrote a very long and comprehensive report on the coup. Now, after having done this research and talking to various actors, how would you describe what happened on the night of July 15th? Well, I think there's still a lot of things that are unclear about what happened uh, on July 15th. It, it's, and there's a lot of things which, you know, are contradictory, and there's a lot of questions that are answered. But because I, I don't, I don't believe it's a kind of open and shut black and white case. Um, there, there's too many. There's too many strange and unanswered. Uh, questions about it, but it looks like for sure uh, that there were a lot of uh, followers of Fatula Gulen who were involved in the coup, and it looks as though, you know, based on the research that I did, that that this is something not 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 the coup um, it, itself, but taking over the Turkish state uh, was something that they have been talking about and preparing for for a long time. Um, so I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I'm not exactly sure what happened on July 15th. Not, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but I, I think that what I suggested in my story was that, you know, the Turkish government had figured out uh, that there were a, that there were hundreds of Gulen followers uh, inside the military, and they were preparing to take action against them. And so I, you know, the, the idea that that the coup d'etat was attempted to, to, to basically stave that off, um, to prevent that from happening, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. I'm not 100% sure, but it, it certainly seems possible and, and likely. Okay. So I want to ask now about the coverage of the coup attempt in the Western and especially American media. The, the yes. Western media has mainly of, focused on the aftermath of the coup and the, and the purge that the government has initiated and preferred not to discuss in depth what happened during the coup attempt. So like, what do you think were the like, main motivations behind this choice and did the opposition to Erdogan hinder a comprehensive analysis of the coup? And also, like, has the Western media's perception about Gulenists has changed? Uh, I have to tell you, you're, you're barely coming through now uh, on the microphone. Uh, okay, but, but I, I think I can. I think I can answer that question. Okay. The, look, I, I thought that the coverage, by and large, in the Western media was was pretty uh, superficial. Uh, it essentially focused on the events of you know that day, 
and then and then the aftermath you know uh the the purges the arrests uh and you know and i i think that part of the reason for that is that you know the the, the turkish government has been repressive uh in the past in the past several years it's been uh oppressive particularly against the press uh it, and and it's democratic opposition it's put people in prison uh there are a lot of journalists in prison they've closed down media outlets and and i think when when so there was a pattern there and so when when the government when the turkish government responded to the coup by essentially doing more of the same um i think it was it was easy to see that as just that as more of the same uh that critics are being arrested uh, because they're inconvenient, not not because they're necessarily criminals. Like I, I you, you know the numbers better than I do, but but even even now, I mean, uh, how many newspapers and television stations and websites have been closed down? Thirty-eight. Um, are all of those related to Fatou Gulen? Um, I don't I don't know, but I I certainly don't think that the proof has been put out that they are. So so I I think that in the Western media there was a focus on that. On, on the coup itself and what came after, but there was not enough focus on what came before, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is what's really what's really crucial here to kind of understand what happened. And that's that's sort of so that's where I, you know, the the bulk of my piece is about events that happened before July 15th, not not really afterwards. Mm -hmm. And do you think the perception about the Gulen movement has changed after the coup, or or it's it's more or less know. the same. That's a that's a really good question. I, I think that I think it's fair to say that there's a lot of skepticism about the 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 explanation that the Turkish government has offered. Um, but you know, the, there's a lot of skepticism about it for the reasons I just said. Essentially, that mm -hmm. um, people in the United States, by and large, don't trust President Erdogan. Uh, because they see him as somebody who, in the past, has not tolerated any kind of criticism very well, or uh, and you know e even even the members of his own opposition in the country. And so there's a lot of skepticism, and I think there's a there's a feeling that uh, the coup uh, the coup attempt was convenient almost for him because it allowed him essentially to crush. Um, you know, whatever remained of his opposition. And so um, I, I think that the truth is in the United States, most people don't know very much about Petula Gulen, but they feel like they do know a lot about President Erdogan. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and in your article, we see a, like a multidimensional descri description of the Gulen movement. On the one hand, you talk about their like school, business networks, etc. But on the other hand, unlike many articles written on the movement in the Western media, you also describe their goal to capture the state and the trials, the political trials, trials they were involved in. They are more like political activities. And yeah. based on one of your sources' of words, you say that the, the movement has a has a dual structure. So after your yeah. research, how would you describe this dual structure? How do you think that dual structure of the Gulen movement operates? I, you know, Zainab, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Okay, I will just, I just told that you, can you hear me now? Not very well, but go ahead. Okay, so like based on one of your sources of words, you say that the Gulen movement has a dual structure. Yeah. Right? Okay, and how would you describe the components of this dual structure, and how do you think this structure oper this dual structure operates? Well, you know, I only know I only know what people told me, and I I think um, you know I had no idea about any of that when I started to work on the story, and then it took me a long time. Um, but I I found some former members of the movement who were willing to talk, and I and I think. You know, for somebody like me, it's a luxury. I, I work for a magazine uh, that has a lot of resources. And so whereas, you know, if you're working for a television station or a website and you're always going 100 miles an hour, you know, you, you sit down and talk to somebody for five minutes uh, and then you move on. And I, I talked to some of these uh, former Gulenists for hours. Um, 
And when you sit with people like that, they start to open up, you know, and they tell you a lot of details. And so what the story that emerged from my discussions was this, you know, that the, the, the Glenn movement has a, has a public face, uh, which in a, a public, a public part of it is public. And we, you know, we've all seen that. That's the schools and the service um, and, you know, their business activities and all that, you know, um, and Gulen's, Gulen's sermons and all that. Um, and all that's pretty positive, you know. And, and again, on the, on the surface, you know, they say we have no interest in politics. We don't want to mix politics and religion. Uh, I mean, Gulen himself told me that. And when I met him, and, but in fact, what apparently there is a secret part of this organization, which is, uh, you know, completely at odds with the public part, um, where the entire strategy uh, is and has been for the past at least 30 years to take over the state. And so there's a lot of energy spent, you know, basically maintaining this dual structure, you know, and, and kind of hiding and keeping secret their real agenda. Um, and I, you know, there, I don't think there's anything, I don't think there's anything like this in the world. Uh, I, I've never seen anything like it. This is like one of the strangest stories I've ever covered. It's essentially how uh, a very cult-like secretive uh, religious order infiltrated a modern state uh, and tried to take it over. Um, I mean, you know, you can't make that up. It sounds like a science fiction movie. So you know that Gulen movement and also the coup attempt of July 15 were perceived by many in Turkey as an American conspiracy. How would you elaborate on the link between Gulen movement and the USA intelligence community? Do you think these allegations are unfounded? What's your take on this subject? Well, I, you know, look, anybody can make allegations and draw, you know, conclusions and make up conspiracies. But I, I try to stick to the evidence. And, you know, if the evidence is there, then I'll, then I'll believe it. I mean, I, I think what's true is what you can prove. And I haven't, I haven't seen any evidence at all uh, that, the, that, that the intelligence community in the United States was in any way involved in the coup. And, and, if, and I would just say, you know, if there is evidence, I'd like to see it. Um, you know, it, it's not enough to, you know, it's not enough to just connect a couple of dots and say, well, they must be involved because it would be ad advantageous for them to do it. It's, that's not enough. I mean, I, I want to see the evidence, and I haven't seen any. Ha having said that, however, um, I think there is evidence, which I put in my story, uh, about uh, possible contact and, and a relationship. Uh, between Gulen and the CIA, uh, dating back, you know, it, to the 1990s, I guess. Um, I found that really interesting. I found it very intriguing. Um, you know, there was I, I talked to former Americans about uh, former American officials about this, as well as uh, former Turkish officials. And I think I quoted one of the, the former head of Turkish military intelligence as saying that he believed that the CIA had a relationship with the Gulen movement and, and that the CIA had placed people in Gulen schools in Africa and, the, and Central Asia. And that's really amazing. Like, I, I don't think it proves at all that the CIA was somehow involved in the coup, but, um, you know, it's, it's the allegation that there was a relationship between, between Gulen and the CIA is absolutely fascinating i you know there's not really enough there to draw a conclusion about it or to draw many conclusions about it um but there's enough there to be intrigued and to try to find out what the real truth is um and i want to ask you what 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 do you think about the purge that came after the coup like and what do you think it will mean for the future of the Gulen movement and how well you know i i think that these questions, you know, these are, this is a large question, and a question like that, I think, is probably better answered uh, in the, it's better understood in the details. And, you know, the, if you if you look at it broadly, you say, well, uh, there was this uh, really mysterious uh, movement that had 
burrowed its way into the Turkish state and it has people everywhere. And it looks like they were involved in an attempt to take over the government. And like any government, you know, American, Turkish, whatever, that believed that would, would react pretty strongly. Um, and I think they, they clearly, the Turkish government has reason to be really worried. Um, Erdogan, you know, could have been killed. Um, the, I mean, they could have taken over the government. However, I don't, that doesn't justify necessarily, you know, arresting anybody you want to arrest. Um, and I think what's disturbing about the way that, that the Turkish government has conducted itself since the coup is that it's a state of emergency. So, you know, anybody, you know, the government can pretty much do whatever it wants. Um, and doesn't have to show evidence, and it can just detain whoever it wants, uh, no questions asked. And that, you know, that's on its face. That is, that's, that's dangerous. It's disturbing. It's not whatever else it is. It's not democratic. So, um, what was the most difficult part of writing such an article about this coup happened on July 15th? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was the most difficult part? Well. You know, I don't speak Turkish, and I apologize for not speaking Turkish. Um, and so just, uh, you know, working in another language is hard. Uh, you know, Turkey is a complicated country. I think it's complicated for Turks. <laughs> it's definitely complicated for Americans, and especially for Americans who don't speak Turkish. And so I, I just had to be very careful, you know, uh, and I, you know, try to be humble about, you know, what I didn't know. Because I, I don't know everything, and I'm not an expert. I don't consider myself an expert on Turkey, and I just so I, I try to be really, really careful. But that was the hardest part about it was the language barrier. Okay. In the last paragraph of your article, you talk about how Fetullah, Fetullah Gülen wants to be remembered, and I quote <laughs> now: "I wish to die in solitude, with nobody actually becoming aware of my death, and hence nobody conducting my funeral prayer." I wish that nobody remember me, end of quote. Fethullah Gülen said these words during your interview with him on 2014. Why did you prefer to, to end the article with this quote? And also, how do you think, think these words fit into Gülen's cult of personality? Well, I, that interview was 2015, I, uh, last year. Sorry. The, I was, you know, I've never heard anyone, a public figure, that I've ever interviewed ever say anything like that. Um, it's usually quite the opposite, right? I want to be remembered forever and ever by everyone um, <laughs> as a great person. And so it was kind of shocking, but uh, he felt, it felt to me like, uh, I, well, let me, let me back up, because I, it's, it's hard to know what was going on in that interview, because, um, you know, Goulet appears and he did to me as this very modest person, very humble. He doesn't have any political ambitions. Um, I don't. I don't think those things are true. Um, I mean, that, not after the article that I reported out. I mean, I, I think there was a lot that he wasn't telling me, and uh, there was, you know, there was. There's a lot that I found that contradicted everything that he told me, and so. You know, I, I, I feel like, to a certain extent, the, this kind of modest persona that he had, you know, it was kind of an act. Um, it was it was theatrical in a way, and so it's it's hard. I, I, so I think, in other words, I think a lot of what he was saying was, was calculated, uh, you know, for for my consumption and for the consumption of you know my readers. And so I I don't know what he meant. Uh, I don't. Um, you know, he was trying to portray himself as a very humble and modest person, and I, I'm not sure I really buy that anymore. Hmm. But do you think these kinds of words he often utters helps to cultivate his cult of personality? And how do you think it has an effect on his followers? I don't know. I mean, I, it's hard for me to answer that question, too, because, you know, I don't know. When I met him, I mean, I, I think I describe him like this in the article. I, he's not... It's, it's not a very, it, I didn't find it to be a very overwhelming experience. I, I found it quite the opposite. Um, 
I, I don't know. I, it was kind of utterly mystifying to me why anyone would uh, find him, even find him to be a charismatic leader. He was like, he wasn't remotely charismatic. And so it was like really hard for me to understand how these people that I talked to in Turkey had devoted, you know, years of their lives uh, to, to him um, and to his movement. I, I didn't, that was completely baffling to me. And I still is, I just, I do not understand it. And I, I've had conversations with other people about this, not, the conversations I've had have been with Westerners and, I, I, and, and also Turks. And I remember a Turkish person said to me, he's quoted in the interview, a uh, former Glenn member, and he said, this is not something that a non-Muslim would understand, uh, seeing Gulen, you know, and how emotional he gets in the presence of the prophet and all that. And I don't know. So I, I really felt on that one, I felt like it was a big mystery. And I, I still do. I just don't know. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Filkins. <laughs> it was a great pleasure, pleasure to have you tonight and talk with you okay. about your article. Thank, thank you, you very good, much. Good luck with your website and send my best to the Rushan. Okay, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Call me for anything. Okay, uh, bye. To your coup. Thank you for listening to us. Have a good night.